ก็น่ากังวลอยู่คือการทำมาหากินแบบสมัยเก่ามันมันไม่ค่อยมีแล้วนะอย่างเราเราเมื่อก่อนเราอยู่ได้หากินตามแม่น้ําโขงอะไรหาปลาอะไรมันได้หมดนะเดี๋ยวนี้มันไม่มีแล้วก็เรื่องราวเกี่ยวกับความเปลี่ยนแปลงแม่น้ําโขงที่เกิดขึ้นเนี่ยนะครับตลอดระยะเวลาที่ผ่านมาที่มีเขื่อนทางตอนบนเนี่ยยีปีเนี่ยมันก็มีผลกระทบเกิดขึ้นหลายอย่างมันค่อยมีเรือปานมันขึ้นเรือมันเยอะจะมีปลาเดี๋ยวน้ำมันแหงมันมีมีปลาน้อย I think this is not just a problem of the m a k o n g communities anymore it's like everybody's problems whether or not it's China US or it's Vietnam Thai or whatever we defending for the rights of the river we defending for the rights of ourselves Even I am a daughter of the Mekong. I was born here, but this is not my river alone. This is everyone's river because it's the only Mekong river for the world, right? This is only one Mekong river in the entire world, and it's feeding us, it's feeding the ocean, and all the sediment that used to flow to the South China Sea to the oceans being blocked by all those dam, those hydropower stations, and we are not seeing responsible measure to. Mitigate all these problems. The Mekong River flows almost 5,000 kilometers from the Tibetan Plateau through China, Myanmar, Laos, Thailand, Cambodia, and Vietnam, draining into the South China Sea. The river and its tributaries are fundamental to the way of life and cultural identity of the 17 million inhabitants of the Lower Mekong Basin. Of these people, most are fisher folk and farmers who rely on the natural flow of the river for their livelihoods. However, what was a relatively free-flowing river system in the early 90s is, thanks to hydropower development, increasingly engineered and fragmented. In the mid 80s, the construction of a cascade of 12 major dams on the Mekong began as part of Beijing's campaign to develop its relatively poor western provinces. And supply electricity to its booming industrial east coast. This was carried out without consulting or warning those living downstream. We remember the change, the drastic change of the ecosystem, the unusual water fluctuation, the sudden drought, the sudden flood. Regardless, the the seasonal uh, flow of the Mekong River. Today, the the river up by uh, two or three day. Down, them when they have more water, huh? They open them. Downstream flood. Some home, the house lost lost to the river. While the impact of China's dams on events such as these is contested, the affected countries aren't blameless. It's not only only China that. To take responsibility, China definitely they are among the first group that built the dam, ignoring the downstream impacts, uh, ignoring the voice of the local people in downstream countries. But the whole set of actors from the region and outside the region involved. But how to identify them? How to make sure that they behave in the responsible manner? Private companies have been driving construction in search of profit, but downstream countries are also complicit. Laos has staked its economic development on hydropower, with 77 operational dams, two of which are on the Mekong's mainstream. 61 more are planned, seven of which will be on the mainstream. Cambodia announced a 10-year ban on mainstream dams in 2020, but continues to dam tributaries and imports electricity from Laos. Vietnam, which bears the brunt of downstream impacts, is also an upstream dam builder and an investor in Lao dams. Thailand has not built a major dam since 1994, but is the largest investor in Lao dams and purchaser of Lao electricity. Despite early enthusiasm for other Chinese development projects along the Mekong, including for hydropower dams on China's portion of the river, Thailand has grown more cautious about projects that could harm its interests. In early 2020, a Chinese-led project to blast rapids on the Mekong to make way for the navigation of larger ships from China down the river was scrapped by the Thai cabinet. This was due in part to campaigns led by environmental activists such as Kien Pon Dite and Niwat Rai Gao, also known as Kruti. 
we work together to campaign against the uh, Mekong rapid blasting for large-scale navigation that proposed by the by China and Chinese companies. It's like a lot of water, not a lot of water, but it's a lot of water because it's a lot of water to get out of the water. It's a lot of water to get out of the water. It's a lot of water to get out of the water. เรื่องพวกนี้มีผลกระทบหมดใช่ไหมเรื่องของปลาเรื่องของพืชต่างๆที่อยู่ตามเกาะดอนต่างๆแล้วก็จะมีผลกระทบเรื่องความมั่นคงทางอาหารของคนด้วย People raise an issue about the natural resource security, food security and national security. What would happen if all these natural barrier are removed and large scale vessel from from China can come to Thailand easily? The Mekong has become another arena for U.S.-China rivalry. And is sometimes even portrayed by journalists and policymakers as a potential geopolitical flashpoint, comparable to the South China Sea. It's also where the the contest of international power happens. It's the Americans, it's the Chinese, it's the Indonesians, South Korean, Australia. Framing the river as an arena for great power competition irks many people in the region, as it suggests they must make a choice between China and the U.S. Lower Mekong countries face the dilemma of balancing strong economic ties with China, and protecting national interests that may not align with Beijing's approach. The U.S. meanwhile has criticized China's dams on the Mekong and its infrastructure diplomacy. While all this is playing out, poor and marginalized communities in the Mekong Basin are the ones left to deal with the ongoing damage to the river. <laughs> ก็มีหลายอย่างนะที่มันผลกระทบนอกจากหนึ่งเรือมันวิ่งไม่ได้แล้วใช่ไหมเรือมันวิ่งน้ํามันตื้นตื้นเขินเพียงวิ่งไม่ได้แล้วก็ไอ้พวกที่เขาทําประมงนะมันก็มีผลกระทบเขาเพราะน้ํามันจะเปลี่ยนอยู่ตลอดเวลาเพราะว่าในฤดูน้ําหลากเนี่ยฤดูฝนเนี่ยน้ํามันต้องยกระดับสูงขึ้นการที่น้ํามันยกระดับสูงขึ้นในฤดูฝนเนี่ยน้ํามันก็จะไหลเอ่อเข้าไปในแม่น้ําสาขาต่างๆในแม่น้ําโขงปลาจํานวนมากมันก็จะเข้าไปวางไข่แต่ที่ผ่านมาหลายปีที่ผ่านมาหลายบางปีเนี่ยหลายปีที่ผ่านมาบางปีนี่น้ํามันก็ไม่ยกระดับขึ้นเต็มที่ทําให้ปลามันก็ไม่สามารถเข้าไปวางไข่ในแม่น้ําสาขาได้มันก็ทําให้ปลาเนี่ยปริมาณปลามันลดลงมีผลกระทบการที่มีผลมันปลาลดลงก็มีผลกระทบกับคนหาปลากลุ่มพี่น้องชาวบ้านที่พึ่งพาอาศัย Two weeks ago, I went uh, with Kuti on the boat ride on the border, and we stopped at one of the beach where Laotian women came to collect the real wheat, the guy. And I talked to her, and she said, collecting river river wheat during dry season when the water level is clear, she earned as much as 1,500 baht a day, which is huge. And suddenly, when the water level dropped because of the Jing Hong Dam, all her harvest gone. In the normal stage, it gives us not only income, it gives us dignity because it's our own money. We don't have to rely on husband or father or male member of the family. So the value is not only economical value, but it's value, dignity of you as a human. So how can this kind of value be seen and document and systematize in the decision making. That's a huge challenge. These environmental changes may ultimately cause large-scale displacement and migration, which could, in time, lead to social tensions and political instability within each country. Despite this, most Lower Mekong countries continue to build and fund large hydropower dams. Supporters of hydropower argue that dams propel economic development control flooding, reduce drought, and help to alleviate poverty. They also justify hydropower as a source of green and sustainable energy, but not everyone sees it that way. The hydropower in the Mekong River being labeled, mislabeled as a green source of electricity, it could be no carbon, but it's not sustainable, and it actually creates more problems to other people. The cost of large-scale hydropower, including loss of fisheries and sediment, as well as the expenditures necessary to compensate communities that are relocated and provide alternative livelihoods, need to be weighed against the anticipated benefits of generation, irrigation, and flood control. Rivers that flow across borders tend to foster international cooperation, 
rather than conflict. This is a case in the Mekong region, where states cooperate on building large-scale infrastructure, but turn a blind eye to the environmental damage and social impacts that result from it. At the heart of this lies the fear of losing what states see as their sovereign rights to derive maximum economic benefit from available water resources. Despite this, there is still hope. Should policymakers acknowledge what is happening and take action now? A low emission energy future for the region that doesn't depend on large scale hydropower is possible. If investment in renewable energy is accelerated, the lower Mekong Basin countries can reduce or eliminate emissions and still meet rising energy demand by 2050 through a combination of solar, wind, biomass, and off-river pumped hydropower generation. As a biodiversity hotspot, the river should be a priority for international sustainable finance. Collecting and sharing data is crucial for better management of hydropower in the Mekong Basin and for mitigating its impacts, particularly flooding. Data sharing should include affected communities to strengthen early warning systems and to help guide policymaking and encourage accountability. Authorities should also allow those affected to voice their concerns to policymakers and participate in decisions on developments that will affect them. This should help promote the well being of the millions of people living in the river basin. In the meantime, civil society is doing its best to promote initiatives to educate the public about what is going on and to ensure that the value of the Mekong is understood. I'm like myself as a daughter of the river, Kuti is a son of the, the river, and us as a children. So we will be here defending for the rights of the Mekong River as a heritage of everyone. <laughs>